Okay, so if you remember, we have been dealing with the oral Torah, right? And we've been talking about how the oral Torah became something that is now written, right? We've talked over the last couple of classes about, right, we had our Mount Sinai. We talked about the written Torah on that side of the chart and the oral Torah, right? And we said the oral Torah remained oral until who came along? Rabbi Yehuda Nasi came along and wrote the Mishnah. Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, we talked about that. Where was that written? Anybody remember? What country? No. Try again. Well, the country was Israel. Right. Yes, up north, not in Jerusalem. Right. Remember, we said in a town called Tsipuri. If you go up north, um, to like the area where Tzfat is, it's very close to Tzfat, Tiberias, that area, right? That was written down in about the year 180. And then we said that eventually the Gemara was written and we explained Mishnah plus Gemara equals what? Good, very good. Okay, so we talked about the fact we've now covered all the way from when the Torah was given in Mount Sinai, all the way down to the sealing of the Gemara, the sealing of the Talmud in about the year 500 CE. Okay, last time we handed out copies of a page of the Talmud, and I even showed you a volume of the Talmud, and we talked about that the vast, there's much, 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 much more Gemara than there is Mishnah, right? The Gemara is the explanation of the Mishnah. Okay, now, I want to clarify, now that, now that we know all of that, so therefore, if you want to learn oral Torah today, it's not all oral. You pick up a book, we call them Gemaras, or volumes of the Talmud, and we study oral Torah, and it's written down, right? And that's what we talked about last time, and I showed you a, what a page looks like, right? Now I want to talk about exactly what is this v version of the oral Torah, right? As some of you asked, what w w is this from Hashem? Is this from the rabbis, right? What exactly is all this stuff that we find in the Talmud? Okay, where did it come from? Okay, and it's going to turn out that there are actually different categories of things in the Talmud. Okay? What we're going to talk about now is, remember, we said, originally, the Torah was given and we had the written Torah and the oral Torah. And we said, the written Torah cannot be understood without the oral Torah. Right? And we've talked about many, many examples of that. Right? And we showed that it must be that what happened at Mount Sinai is not only did Hashem give the written Torah to Moshe and hand him a book and say, here you go, here is a copy of the written Torah, right? Now, but as he said to Hashem, as Hashem said to Moshe, write it down word for word, letter for letter, he would say, stop, don't write this part down, let me explain it to you, right? And that was the oral Torah. So the oral Torah in its origins is something that Hashem told to Moshe, just like the written Torah is. Just the written Torah was words and letters, and the oral Torah was concepts. We even talked about why is the oral Torah, why was it given that way? Anybody remember when we talked about this? Those of you who were here? Right? Huh? Good, but why? Why did Hashem make it that way? Right? So one of the ideas we discussed, we discussed several different ideas. One of the ideas we discussed was in law school, right, they teach you the law, but they also teach you cases. Right? In this case, this happened, in that case, this happened, in that case, this happened. Right? Why? Why do we say they do that in law school? Is it just examples or is it new ideas that you're learning? Are you learning something in your case law class? that you didn't learn when they taught you the law? What are you learning? practicality. Good, but why can't you learn that just by, le you're right. Why can't you learn that just by learning the law? Because you need examples for the place to understand it better. Okay, good. So it's even more than that, right? It's that when you're teaching a law, it's not just, it's not something that can be written down into a simple sentence. I remember we talked about, huh? There's always exceptions, right? Or there's a new case, it's a borderline case. Right, for example, if you say do not kill, right, and then somebody kills somebody in self-defense, we have to say, well, wait a second. It says if you kill somebody, go to jail, he killed somebody. So yeah, but he killed himself in self-defense. You say, well, is that, called, is that what the law means or is that not what the law means? <laughs> and then you can write in, okay, don't kill except in self-defense. And then somebody kills somebody, right, in self-defense because they're about to shoot a rubber band at them. 
right? And we say, no, 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 don't kill somebody, accept in self-defense if somebody else was trying to kill you, right? And no matter how many different, and then somebody kills somebody by accident, and then somebody kills somebody indirectly by unplugging a machine, and, right? All these different cases, no matter how expansive you try to make the written law, you will always need to say about what's the intent behind it, right? That's why in American law, right? Today is 4th of July, right? In American law, they always ask, what was the intent of the founders? On the right time, at the right time, right? What was the intent of the founders, right? Because I don't just, I, it's not enough to just know what the written law is. I got to know, yeah, but what do they mean, right? So that's what the oral Torah is. The oral Torah is Hashem explaining not just what the words say, but what the words mean, right? And therefore, we talked about all kinds of things that are very ambiguous in the Torah, or maybe even misleading. For example, when it says an eye for an eye, right? No, Jew, no court in Jewish history has ever taken that verse literally, even though we take the whole Torah literally. How do they all know that? Because when, the, when, Moshe, when Hashem told Moshe, write down these words, ayin tachas, ayin, which means an eye for an eye, he said, wait, stop, let me explain to you. That's not literal, right? even though everything else in the Torah is literal, right? And Hashem explained it to him. So that's what the oral Torah was. It was the explanation given by Hashem to Moshe of what the written Torah means, and the written Torah is really useless without that, okay? That is the oral Torah that Hashem gave to Moshe, right? Now, how did Moshe, Moshe had the same problem Hashem did, right? How is Moshe supposed to pass this on to the next generation, right? If the, if the oral Torah is concepts, not just things that can be simply written down in sentences, so how could Moshe pass it on to the next generation, right? So Moshe did deal the same thing they do in law school. He taught case law, right? And instead of saying, okay, here's the law, he would say, in this case, the law is like this, right? But in this case, the law is like, not like that, right? For example, he might say, you know, if you have a sheep, right? If you have a pen of sheep, and one of your sheep gets out of the pen and causes damage to your neighbor's property, so if you locked it, if you locked your gate properly and some other sheep got it anyway, you're exempt. But if you didn't lock it properly and the sheep got out, then you'd be obligated, right? And we talked about the case, what happens if I have, I told you, the obscure case, which probably doesn't happen very often, but if you had access to a roof and you kept your sheep up there, right, and your sheep happens to, God forbid, fall off the side of the 10th story roof, right, on its way down to its woolly end, right, it happens to land in your friend, your neighbor's tomato patch, right, creating a big woolly red mess, Right? Saving the sheep's life, but destroying your neighbor's tomatoes. Do you have to pay or don't you have to pay? Right? So the rule is that you have to pay, but not for the value of tomatoes, just for the value of what it would have cost to put like a pillow or something there, right? Just from the benefit you got from it. Okay, so those are examples of that rule, if we would, you know, that's a case, but that case is really representing a principle. So Moshe would tell it to the next generation in the form of cases. This case, yes, this case, no, this case, yes, this case, no, until the next generation understood. And they could say, oh, wait, let me try. So this case, yes, and this case, no. And Moshe would say, no, wait, you don't have it yet. Let's keep going. Let me give you another example. In this case, yes, in this case, no. Right? And what if we change this variable? And they say, oh, if you change that variable, it would change the ruling. But if you change that variable, it wouldn't change the ruling. And they say, oh, now I see you've got it. Now you pass it on to the next generation. Right? And that's how the oral Torah was passed down. It was passed down in the form of cases Right? Even though that's not what the oral Torah is. The oral Torah is principles. Right? I always use this as an example of this. Have you ever played the game, I'm going on a picnic and I can bring... Do you ever play that game? Yeah. Right? So you say, like, I'm going on a picnic and I can bring balls, but I can't bring um, friends. And I can bring birds, but I can't bring cats. And I can bring um, beer, but I can't bring wine. And I can bring my friend Brian, but I can't bring my friend David. And I can bring um, brown things, but I can't bring green things. Anybody picking up? Yeah, what, what can I bring? I can bring a bottle, but not a glass. Good, I can bring a bottle, but not a glass. Excellent. Right, anybody else? Right, what else? I can bring a bat, but not a glove. Very good. I can bring a bat, but not a glove. Anybody else picking up on this? <laughs> So, yeah, like, yeah, right. I can bring things that are blue and other things that are red, right? I could bring um, Beirut, but I couldn't bring 
Jerusalem. I could bring a bench, but I can't bring a towel. Very good. I could bring a bench, but I can't bring a towel. Right? Good. I could bring a bath, but I couldn't bring a shower. Right? I could bring a balloon, but I can't bring a flower. Good. Right? Okay. In the interest of time, what's the rule? Things that start with B. Good, you got it. Right? I can bring things that start with B, and I can't bring things that don't start with B. Now, I didn't tell you that rule. I just told you lots of cases. And then eventually, people started to pick up on it. Some people faster than others. Right? <laughs> so, right? That's, I mean, that happens to be a simple rule, right? Things that start with B. But you can imagine a very complicated rule that in, rather than just telling you the rule, I would say, I can do this, but I can't do that. I can do this, I can't do that. And then you'd get it. And you'd say, oh, so I can do this and I can't do that. And I'd say, right, very good. And then sometimes somebody says, oh, I got it. I can bring cars, but I can't bring buses. And I'd say, no, sorry, you, don't, you didn't get it. Let's keep going, right? So that's how the oral Torah was passed down generation to generation to generation, right? You can understand why the previous generation has to really make sure that the next generation really understands it well. Because in order to give it over in the form of cases, you've got to really know the principle very, very well. Right? OK? So that's what happened. Every generation gave it over in the form of cases. Now, that's why if you read the Mishnah, the Mishnah reads like case law. The Mishnah is a bunch of cases. Like the examples I gave you about the sheep, those were Mishnahs. Right? Um, what's another example of a Mishnah? The Mishnah says, you know, if two brothers married two sisters and they forgot wh who married which one, right? So what happens, right? Because now you can't be married to your wife's sister. So if you get it wrong, then you're in big trouble, right? So again, that case is probably never going to happen. But the point is, we don't care if it happens. I want to illustrate a principle to you. I'm not really bringing Beirut and not Jerusalem, right? I just said that so that I could help you learn the principle. So the cases aren't necessarily about this is really likely to happen. The cases are about, let me teach you a principle, and this is a good illustration of the principle, right? So that's what a Mishnah is, right? Okay, now the Gemara then asks all the questions. It says, wait a second. It says if you lock the gate properly, then you're exempt. Well, what does it mean to lock it properly, right? And what if you locked it properly, um, but then somebody else unlocked it? Is that person obligated? Right? Or what happens if it wasn't sheep? What happens if we changed it to um, horses? Does that change the story? And does it matter how the sheep caused the damage? Does it matter whether the sheep ate grass or whether the sheep uh, tore something up or, right, or whether it, it killed a small animal? Right? Like what exactly? And what if the sheep got damaged in the process? Does the other person have to pay for it? Those are all questions that the Gemara would have to say. You have to analyze this Mishnah and be able to understand all of those things. Right? OK, so that's what it looks like as you go through from here down to here. This is all cases, right? But what we're trying to get back to is the principle. And the principle is what Hashem gave to Moshe. Yeah. OK, so I understand like, the written Torah with people at Sinai and so many people at Sinai. And there's like, so much information Okay, good. So the answer is they're not prophets, right? But one second, let's again trace the history. At Mount Sinai, right? The Jewish people stood there. Everybody heard God say the first commandment. Everybody heard God say the second commandment, right? And then the people said, this is too intense for us. Moshe, we want you to get the rest of the Torah of Moshe and tell it to us. And everybody heard Hashem say, Moshe, come up the mountain. Moshe went up the mountain, and he stayed up there for 40 days and 40 nights, came down, found they were making a golden calf, right? smashed the two tablets, and eventually went back up and got the Torah again in 40 days and 40 nights. Right? Now, in those 40 days and 40 nights, that's where the whole written Torah, except for the first two commandments, right? the whole written Torah comes from that and also the whole oral Torah, right? So Moshe came down and said, okay guys, you heard the first two commandments, here's the rest, and here's the oral Torah that goes along with it. Right? And Moshe taught that to the next generation, right? So now you had Moshe, right? Everybody knew Hashem had appeared, said I'm giving you a Torah, Moshe come up the mountain, and Moshe came down and said, here it is, right? So that's, that's what happened in that generation. Now, that generation, busied themselves with learning the oral Torah, right? And then they passed it to the next generation. 
So there was never a period in history where there was a generation that had never heard of the oral Torah, and all of a sudden some rabbi showed up and said, hey guys, oral Torah. Right? Every generation knew the oral Torah. And even the generation when the Mishnah was written down, they all knew the oral Torah. All Rabbi Yudha Anasi did was took what everybody had already heard about and put it into written form. Well, I've got like a broken telephone. Ah, okay, so we discussed that in a previous class. So I'll be happy to talk to you about that privately. Okay, but uh, that's a very important question that we've discussed why, even though we're all familiar with the game broken telephone, we still believe, it's, it's still logical to believe that it was passed down perfectly. Right, well, so we could talk about that. Yeah? Um, my question was that after Moshe came down after the 40 days for 40 nights, smashed the tablets, you said he taught them? Well, he went back up again like later. Right after? Or he taught them and then went back up? No, he came down, right, and then he immediately went back up, prayed for 40 days and 40 nights that Hashem should forgive them. He did. And then he eventually told Moshe, okay, now you can come back up and get the Torah again. And that time Moshe came down and gave them the second set of tablets, and that's when he began teaching the Torah. So how can it take people today their whole lives to learn Torah, and they, keep, they don't even like, learn at all, but Moshe was able to hand the entire Torah and oral Torah down to the Jewish, the entire Jewish people, like individually, everyone knew it? So, well, again, first of all, the written Torah he had written, so he handed them that. Right? Then the oral Torah, that's what he started doing. Right? They're, remember, they were in the desert. Right? They weren't doing anything else. Nobody had jobs, nobody had anything. All they did was sit and Moshe would teach them oral Torah all day long right? to the entire generation. Right? Everybody would gather around Moshe and Moshe would teach the oral Torah. Right? And that's what they did right? until people knew as much oral Torah as they could know. Right? And then that generation had to pass it on to the next generation. And we will talk about did anything get forgotten or not? talk about that today, hopefully. Why did he break the tablets? Why did he break the tablets? Because he saw that they were worshiping the golden calf, right? Which was a big no-no, right? So therefore, he, des he said, this generation doesn't deserve to receive this Torah right now. They then did tshuva, right? They repented. And then Hashem, and Hashem was happy with the fact that Moshe decided to break the tablets, right? Then after they did tshuva, Hashem said, okay, now they, because they, I've forgiven them, now they are again worthy to receive the Torah, and he gave the Torah again, right? But a generation that would, 40 days after hearing Hashem speak, worship a golden calf, at that point, they couldn't receive the Torah. They weren't worthy, right? They also lived longer back then, right? So they could... Um, I'm not sure it's clear in Moshe's time that they lived longer. I mean, Moshe lived 120, right? Which is pretty long. But, uh, but the rest of the generation, I'm not sure that they lived quite that long, right? One of the reasons I'm sure that Moshe got to live long was so that he could ensure that the next generation had learned it properly before he, before he left, right, before he passed away, right? Okay, any other questions? Good questions. Okay, so um, now, so that's what happened, right? So the, so the oral Torah, the Mishnah and the Gemara are representations in the, in the form of cases working our way back so that if you learn this properly, you will arrive at the principle that was given to Moshe at Mount Sinai, right? Okay, so therefore, when you ask, is the Mishnah divine? We believe the written Torah, word for word, letter for letter, is divine. Is the Mishnah divine? What's the right answer to that question? What do you think? You get more or less a 50-50 shot. No, why not? Because they like, connected that while they were writing it. It was, like, it was already like many generations later. Good. Okay, good. So it's not like God dictated word for word, letter for letter, what the Mishnah should say, like he did with the written Torah. Yeah. But is there a difference between like divine and holy, for example? Like the sitter, after I'm done praying with it, I kiss it. Mm -hmm. not, I mean, so it's not divine, but I still treat it as holy after. Good. So yes, a Mishnah, when you close a Mishnah or a Gemara, you should certainly kiss it, right? Why? If it's not word for word, letter for letter, the word of Hashem, then why is it holy? Um, I don't want to say anything that's going to seem slightly idol worshipy. Very, very careful. I was going to say it's a conduit by which like holy things are accomplished, right? Like praising God is a holy thing. Mm -hmm. But then to say like there's like, an intermediary between that, it's like, Okay, well, one second. Let's stick to, the, to these. Right, the Mishnah and the Gemara. 
Right? What is holy about that? They're like their origins. Good. What are their origins? Horrible. Good. Meaning this is the man-written case book to illustrate these God-given principles. Right? So the answer is, to the question, is the Mishnah divine? The answer isn't really yes or no. It's yes and no. Right? Meaning the words of the Mishnah are not divine. But the concepts which the Mishnah are trying to teach are divine. Right? And that's why, really, the oral Torah was always oral, right? because it was passed down in your own words, in your own cases. What Rabbi Yudha Nasi did when he wrote the Mishnah was that from now on, everybody will learn this principle by learning the same case. Right? So have you ever wondered why, whenever people talk about Gemara, they're talking about these completely antiquated situations. Like, why don't we talk about, you know, if your truck hits my car, or if, you know, your... Um, you know, if you download things onto your iPhone that, you know, without paying for them. Why is none of that in the Mishnah? The answer is, had this process stayed oral, it would be, right? But what Rabbi Yudha Nasi did when he came along was say, from now on, this is, people don't know the oral Torah well enough that we can just rely on the fact that the next generation will be able to do that. I'm going to write down cases, learn these cases, and they will help you arrive at the right principle. Don't make up your own cases anymore, right? Even the leaders of the generation, your job is just to teach Mishnah. Don't make up your own cases, right? Still teach it, and it still has to be learned from a person because you still have to know how to learn the Mishnah, right? But it's going to be taught in these words, in these cases, right? And then 300 years later, Ravina and Ravashi said, you know what? People don't only need a Mishnah now, they need to be able to explain the Mishnah. They need to understand the Mishnah. So therefore, they wrote down the Gemara, right? And now what we do when we learn oral Torah is we learn the words of the Mishnah, we learn the words of the Gemara, right? And we try to arrive at the principles that are behind them, right? This is why, by the way, right, why do people go to rabbis for advice, right? Like, if you want to say, rabbi, is this pot kosher, right? Or rabbi, what was Noah's son's name, right? So the rabbi could say, oh, that's a good question. What was Noah's son's name? Look, it says it right here. Noah's son was, and I could tell you who Noah's sons were, right? But why do people come to a rabbi and say, rabbi, should I marry this guy or should I not marry this guy? Right? Should I live in this community or should I live in that community? Should I stay in seminary longer or should I go back now? Like, who is a rabbi to know? It doesn't say it anywhere here. Right? So the, the goal in learning oral Torah is that if you would know oral Torah, you would know how Hashem thinks. Right? That's what the principles are. Right? They're how Hashem thinks. It's just that we have to give that over in cases that are very concrete. So therefore, when we teach it, we, we learn about sheep and about goats and about falling off of roofs and about tomatoes and about brothers marrying sisters and right, about all kinds of things like that. But what we're really trying to arrive at is something so much broader than that and so much deeper than that that it can apply to all kinds of cases. right? So therefore, if one really internalizes these, this Mishnah and Gemara, not just memorizes them, but really gets to the principle behind them, they're tapping into a, a truth right, which is applicable to all kinds of things. Right? So that's what the study of the oral Torah is today. Right? We're trying to arrive at that principle that was given from Hashem to Moshe at Sinai, and we're doing it by learning about cases which may or may not be relevant or may or may not be applicable to the 21st century, right? but the concepts behind them are what everything is based on. Right? Okay, now, we're going to elaborate on that a little bit. Any questions up until here? Okay, fine. So. Now, all of what I've said so far is based on the idea that everything in the Mishnah is exactly what was given to the, to, uh, by Hashem to Moshe, just in case form. Now I'm going to tell you that it's not exactly that simple. Right? There are basically three different types of oral Torah that we find in the Talmud. Right? The first one is the kind of thing that we've just, just talked about now. Right? Things that we know because... We have a tradition, they've passed down from teacher to student, teacher to student, all the way from Mount Sinai till the time the mission was written down. Right, again, if you have this packet in front of you, right, so remember I showed you on the last page, the page looks like this. This is a list of teacher to student, teacher to student, teacher to student. Well, number one on the list is Hashem, number two on the list is Moshe, right, number 131 on this list is my rabbi's rabbi, right. So we understand that we, something could get passed down, 
teacher to student, teacher to student, teacher to student, and all the way from number one till me being number 133 maybe and you being number 134 maybe, right? So Rabbi Yudah Anasi was number 39 on this list, right? So there are many things in the Mishnah, maybe, maybe most of the Mishnah, that we would say, you know how they knew this? Right? How did they know if a sheep falls off a roof and lands in a tomato patch that you have to pay for the price of a pillow? How did they know that? So one possibility is they knew it because they had a direct transmission of that principle all the way down from Moshe, all the way till generation 39, Rabbi Yudanasi, right? And Rabbi Yudanasi wrote it down, and that's how you and I, when we learn it, we're tapping into something that was given at Mount Sinai. Okay? That's one type of oral Torah. There are two more types of oral Torah. Right? I'm going to skip number two for a minute because it's the most complicated. We'll come back to it. Right? Number three, we're also not going to delve into completely today, but you should know it's there and we will discuss it in more detail. Okay? Number three is, and this is the one that a lot of people don't like, rabbinic addition. Right? Meaning there are things in the Mishnah that were not necessarily given by Hashem to Moshe at Mount Sinai, and the rabbis of the time of the Mishnah or the Gemara added to the oral Torah, right? So you can get things in the oral Torah which are not the word of Hashem, they're not divine, they are rabbi-made, man-made, right? And they're part of the oral Torah, right? Now, those rabbinic laws which were added, right, they break up into two groups. One is called gezerot, that's the plural of the word gezerah, and the other one is called takanot, which is the plural of the word takana. Right? What is a gezerah? So a gezerah is a decree. And what it is, is a fence around the Torah. That there were times that the rabbis saw, we will discuss in a separate class where they got the authority to do this. Right? Take it as a given for right now that the written Torah itself gives the rabbis the authority to create gezerot and takanot. Right? A gezerah is a fence around the Torah. So what would happen is sometimes the rabbis would see that people are violating a rule that's in here, right? And they would say, why are they doing that? They're doing that because they're getting too close to the thing they're not supposed to be doing, right? So in order to get this generation to stop doing that thing, what we need to do is expand the scope of what's prohibited, right? What's a classic case of this? The Torah says you can't eat meat and milk. Now what's meat? Good, so meat is, it actually says goat right in here, but it means the meat from a kosher domesticated animal, right? So a sheep, a goat, a cow, right? That's what's prohibited by the Torah, to eat with cheese, right? What about chicken? Chicken and turkey and all kinds of things like that, and deer for that matter, venison, which is not a domesticated animal, right? Are kosher, right? But they're not considered meat by the Torah, right? Therefore, according to the Torah, if you want to eat chicken and cheese, go right ahead, right? But the rabbis came along and said, we are adding on to the Torah that not only can't you eat meat and cheese, you can't eat chicken and cheese either, right? Now that was not given by Hashem to Moshe at Mount Sinai. The rabbis came along later and added that law, right? The reason they added that law was to protect a law in the written Torah, right? That's called the Gezerah, okay? I'm sure you all have lots of questions about that. We will have a whole class where we'll talk about that, okay? But, so that's number one. Number two is something called Takanot, where that's where the rabbis make up a law, not because they're trying to protect the Torah law, but because they realize something new is necessary in this generation, right? For example, Purim and Hanukkah. Right? Purim and Hanukkah were not in the Torah. They happened after the giving of the Torah. Right? The story of Purim and the Torah, story of Hanukkah. The rabbis created a new holiday called Purim and called Hanukkah. Right? Now you can read about Purim. There's a whole volume of the Talmud called Megillah, which is about Purim. Right? But that's a rabbinic edition. It's not in the written Torah. Right? And it wasn't in the oral Torah that was given to, by Hashem to Moshe. It was added later by the rabbis. Right? Yeah. But I thought that all the events were in Torah. So, again, there is an idea that all the rabbinic laws, they found something in the Torah alluding to that, right? In other words, it wasn't necessarily, it's not explicit in the Torah, 
right? Like, no, one second, what do you mean? Like, so for Hanukkah, for example, if it's not written in the Torah, then, like, what proof do we have that the rabbis didn't just... I'm not saying they made it up, but, like... Right, okay, so look, first of all, we have history books that talk about this time, these time periods, right? Um, you know, and uh, Jewish and non-Jewish accounts of, of what happened, right? So we, we have other accounts, right? But we also, look, you know, again, the same way it's hard to imagine how somebody could make up the Mount Sinai event, it's hard to imagine how somebody could have made up the Hanukkah story, right? That all of a sudden one generation was told that, hey, by the way, there was uh, this amazing war, there was a temple which was almost destroyed, and then there were this small group of Jews that defeated the Greeks, right? and uh, people said, that's funny, we never heard of Greeks. We didn't know there was a temple, right? So the, it's hard to imagine how that got made up, right? Again, the same way that it would be hard, I, unfortunately there are people who do it, but to say that World War II never happened, or World War I never happened, or the Revolutionary War in America never happened. Again, talking about today's date, right? But uh, yeah, so again, those kinds of things. Right? Also, another example of this is that the rabbis instituted certain laws. They realized that society, in order for society to work, there have to be people who can lend and borrow money. Right? Very few people buy a house without borrowing money. Right? So societies have always needed people to lend and borrow money. Now, the rabbis found that at certain time periods, people were not lending money because of certain Jewish laws which make it difficult for a lender to get their money back. Right? So the rabbis instituted new takanas, new rules, right? making it easier for lenders to get their money back. Right? So that society would continue to function properly. Right? So that's another example of takanas, of rabbis coming along and saying, we're going to create new laws. These are rabbinic. This is not part of the God-given oral Torah. Right? We're going to create new laws, but we're doing it because we see that society needs it to function. Okay? So those are the two types of rabbinic laws, gazerot and takanot. Again, we'll come back to that. Okay, so, so far we have the, the, the divine oral Torah, which was given to Moshe and passed down generation to generation until it was written down in the Mishnah and then the Gemara. And we have the rabbinic editions, which are not divine. They're, rabbi, they're man-made, right, based on the system that the Torah lays out of how man should add on to the Torah, which we'll talk about. Okay, fine. Now let's talk about number two. Number two is interesting. Sorry. Yeah. So you started listing one, two, three, and I didn't understand what the like uh, umbrella concept was. Like what? This is types of oral Torah, meaning everything in the Mishnah is one of these three things. It's actually probably the Rambam breaks up into five groups. I'm I'm simplifying it. I mean, for example, these are two of them, right? But so, right? One is things that we just know. It was passed down correctly from teacher to student, teacher to student, right, without the game of broken telephone, all the way to the Mishnah, right? These things were never passed down. They were created, right? When the, let's put it this way. These things, when the Mishnah tells them to us, it's revealing to us what happened then. These things, when the Mishnah tells it to us, it's creating a new law, right? So is the Mishnah divine is not really a fair question because it depends which type of Mishnah you're talking about. Is this a Mishnah that's telling me something that was passed down generation to generation? Yes, it's divine. Not necessarily in the words, but in the concept. Is it a rabbinic edition? Then it's not divine, but it's not pretending to be. Right? Okay. Is that clear? Yes. Fine. Any other questions? Okay, so the second type, right, which is a fascinating part of the oral Torah, which maybe is the majority of the oral Torah, is laws derived from written Torah. Right? And again, we're going to continue this next time, that that concept, but let's just talk about it. Let's start talking about it now, right? That many times in the oral Torah, you will find something in the Mishnah, and then the, the Gemara will ask, where do you know that from, right? How do you know that law? Now, sometimes the Mishnah will say, the, the rabbis will answer, I know it because it was passed down to me from my teacher, right? But most of the time, not. Most of the time, the rabbis will say, I know it because it's taught in the following verse. And then they will quote a verse, a pasuk in the Torah. And very often they will say, because of the extra vav in that word, that vav is there to teach me this law. Right? I mentioned last time the law about honoring your older sibling. Have we talked about that? Yeah, it's learned out from an extra word. 
Right? There's a, it doesn't say anywhere in the written Torah they have to honor your, honor your sibling, your older sibling. The Gemara says it. And the Gemara says, you know how I know you have to honor your, your older sibling? Because of this verse in the Torah. Right? Now, it, I read the Torah and I say, wait a second. I don't see that here. Right? It doesn't say anywhere in here. There's an extra word, I agree. But it doesn't say that, that word means I should honor my older sibling. Right? So how do you know it means that? So one possibility is what my teacher told me and his teacher told him going all the way back. But there is also a type of learning that one can do. Again, we'll talk about where the authority for this comes from. right? But there is a type of learning one can do where one can say, I can derive information from the written Torah, right? and that will be part of the oral Torah. In other words, it's not that my teacher told me this. It's that I see a verse in the Torah with an extra word in it, and I am deriving a piece of information from that word. Right? I'll give you another example of that. Right? We talked about sukkis. What do we shake on Sukkot? Uh, Good, the lulav and the esrog. esrog. What's an esrog? Right. Good, a fruit. What color is it? Yellow, Yellow or green. Right? It's, it's a citrus fruit, sort of like a lemon or a lime, but, not, but neither of those. It's its own fruit called an esrog. Right? Now, where in the Torah does it say that you should take an esrog on Sukkot? It says that you should take a pre eight hadar, a beautiful fruit. Right? <laughs> now, that should mean that you should have different people showing up to synagogue, right? One with his beautiful apple, another one with a gorgeous peach, somebody with an avocado, right? Everybody should like, have their favorite fruit, and they should be there shaking it, right? But yet, everybody knows that, at least now, that you bring an etrog. And it says that very explicitly in the Mishnah, that you have to shake four things, and one of them is an esrog, right? It doesn't say that in the Chumash, right? All it says is pre hadar. Now the Gemara asks, how did you know that a pre hadar means an esrog, right? And you have two options of how you're gonna answer that. Either you're gonna say, I had a direct tradition, going all the way back to Mount Sinai, going back to Mount Sinai, and God said, Take a pre eight hadar, and he told Moshe, Moshe, that means Esrog, and it got passed down generation to generation until it got written down in the Mishnah. That's one possibility. The other possibility is we say, no, I'm deriving that from other things it says in the verse, right? Since it says this and it says that, and the Talmud ends up deriving from other things it says in the verse, that this must mean an etrog. Right? And it builds a logical argument based on things derived from the way the Torah said it, right? Now, the obvious question, if, so, if things are derived that way, is, well, one second. Why didn't they know that from Mount Sinai? Right? In other words, if, the, if it's true that, let's go back to the, brother, the older sibling example. Right? Did Hashem say it at Mount Sinai, honor your older sibling? Right? If so, then why do I have to derive it from a word? But if he didn't say it at Mount Sinai, why didn't he? Right? Can everybody hear the question? Meaning, why am I deriving things from the verses? Either it was given in Mount Sinai, in which case it should have gotten passed down all the way to here, right? Or it wasn't given in Mount Sinai, in which case, why wasn't it given in Mount Sinai? And why do I, why do I have to now derive it from a verse? Okay? So, I'm going to end off kind of with a cliffhanger, but I'm going to tell you that there are two different answers, to, two different approaches to the answer to that question. Right? One answer is that Hashem intentionally, when he gave the oral Torah, left things out of it and gave us rules of how to derive things from the Torah and say, you know what? I'm not just going to spoon feed you everything, right? I'm going to tell you some of the oral Torah. I'm going to give you the tools of how to study written Torah. You figure out the rest, right? And Hashem left holes in the oral Torah in order for us to then go through and say, hey, what is a pre Hadar? What is a beautiful fruit? Right? And to work it out and to eventually figure out, ah, therefore, using the rules of how to have analyze text, I figured out that it's an esrog. Right? That is the approach of the, the Rambam. Right? The Rambam says that is how, why you have things that are, so many things that are derived from the written Torah. It's because Hashem left them out of the oral Torah intentionally and put them into the written Torah in such a way that they could be extracted. Right? And he wanted us to do the work. That's the Rambam's approach, right? There's another approach written by somebody you might not have heard of, right, called the Ur HaChayim, 
Right? The Or Achayim says no. What happened was, as much as we've described why there wasn't a given broken telephone, nevertheless, there were things that were lost. Right? As time went on, there were things that were lost or forgotten or two different accounts came down. Whatever it was, by the time it came down to time to the Mishnah, there were parts of the oral Torah that people didn't remember anymore. Right? Or people had differences of opinion about. Right? But luckily for us, Hashem knows everything that's going to happen. And therefore, when Hashem gave us the oral Torah, He gave us an emergency reboot disk, the written Torah. And He said, listen, here's the oral Torah. I'll give you everything. Right? Including the law that you have to honor your older sibling. Right? But if you ever lose any of this, if you follow these rules of textual analysis, you'll be able to re-extract it from the written Torah. Right? That everything in the oral Torah can be extracted from the written, from the written Torah if you know what you're doing. Right? So according to the Or Chaim, we actually had it at Mount Sinai, and we lost it, and we regained, we're regaining it by an analyzing the text. According to the Rambam, no. It wasn't given at Mount Sinai. Hashem left it for us to, to extract from the Chumash, right? Okay, so that's type number two. Then we're going to talk more about that next time. So type number one are things that we just know because it got the, the plan worked. It worked when teacher, student, teacher, student, teacher, student, all the way down to Rabbi Yudha and Nasi wrote it down. Type number two are things that the Mishnah knows because we're, that we're extracting them, we're, we're analyzing the text, and that works in one of these two ways. And type number three are things that the rabbis added. They are not from Mount Sinai, according to everybody, but they were added because they're either fences around the Torah or new things that that generation needed. Okay? We're going to go more into all of this. But so the answer to, is the oral Torah divine? I mean, is, depends on whether it's one, two, or three. One is definitely divine. Two is one way or another divine, either because Hashem gave it and we forgot, but we, get, we got it, or because Hashem didn't get it, but he wanted us to get it out of the Torah. Part three is not defined. It was rabbinically added. Okay? Talk more about that next time. Thank you. No problem. Have a great week. Thank you.